everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have uh, Charter Fearsome, uh, educator, researcher and a physio uh, out of Bergen in Norway. Today we're going to be discussing lower back pain and CFT, cognitive functional therapy. Charter, mm-hmm. why don't you give the guys and girls listening a quick one to two minute intro about yourself and then we'll dive on in from there. Right. Welcome. So th- yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, asking me to come on. Uh, that's a pleasure. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a physio and a manual therapist, and, and I've also done a PhD in, in sort of cognitive functional therapy area. Uh, I live in Bergen in Norway. Um, I did my bachelor degree actually in England, uh, mm-hmm. Newcastle where it was raining a lot uh, as it is in Bergen so uh, that made me think if I'm ever going to go abroad again it's definitely going to be to a, a, a different type of place so I that's why Sydney, I, right? I, it, it was uh, it was yeah. actually it was actually Perth oh okay right <laughs> uh, but it's same same country uh, and all very sunny so uh, I went there in uh, 2000, 1999 uh, and it's kind of relevant because that's where I first uh, got in touch with uh, Peter O'Sullivan and uh, his work. And uh, that sort of connection then led on later to what was going to be my PhD and the journey I've had so far. So definitely the, the impact of, uh, of Perth and, and Curtin University uh, made a big change for, for my uh, trajectory as a physio, if you can say that. Okay, great. So I think most people listening to this or everyone listening to this is going to be aware of low back pain uh, in some form or another, maybe from personal experience, first hand, second hand, whatever. However, CFT, cognitive functional therapy, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about what that is? Yes, I'll try uh, my best. And and I think uh, it depends how far you want to go back because uh, as you may be familiar with it's kind of changed over the years uh, but if I'm where to sort of put a label on it now it's it's basically a multi-dimensional clinical reasoning framework uh, that allows the, the clinician and the patient together to explore uh, multiple sides of their uh, their impact of their pain problem if that's fair to say um, so what does that mean in in sort of concrete terms It means obviously that that we are uh, also dealing with uh, the the chance to um, eliminate uh, red flags disorders. So there has to be some form of understanding of of what that is and what kind of signs that would elicit to to suspect that. Um, It's also then uh, trying to figure out uh, how can we separate the more specific uh, disorders, uh, nerve root compression, say a corticoina type sim- symptoms, uh, uh, stenosis type uh, uh, presentations and, and diagnosis. And then we have the big group of, of the non-specific low back pain. And from that, it's usually all formed from the patient's individual story. So, so as we know, no patients are the same. Uh, so we need to sort of delve into what kind of story is the patient bringing into us and what kind of sort of context and background do they have when they come to see you, which is all very relevant for how we uh, approach our patients in, in the in a further process. Uh, with that, we also want to know what kind of uh, stage we're dealing with. So whether this is an acute uh, presentation, uh, a subacute or recurrent form or, or a more uh, chronic or persistent type of presentation. Within the system, there's also uh, 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 thinking around uh, what type or, of, of pain feature uh, the patient presents with. So. Uh, whether it's more nociceptive, neuropathic, it can, it can be nociplastic, or, or whether it's a mixture of these. So you try to look at uh, both the characteristics, uh, whether it's sort of mechanical, non-mechanical, or uh, whether the, the, you think the sensitivity is, is high and low. And usually in conjunction with uh, the interview, you'll use uh, the Orbro screening questionnaire, which then delves into the uh, yellow flags, 
so what kind of cognitive factors are there, affective factors, what kind of social factors are there uh, with the patients? Do they have support in their life? Uh, how are they coping with their, uh, their pain? Do they believe that, that it's going to go away? Uh, what kind of coping strategies are they using? Um, and you're also, of course, then looking at uh, how does, uh, say, blue flags influence them? So at their work, uh, how is that influenced by their condition? And what can they do to uh, alleviate their pain? Or what kind of support do they have uh, either continuing to work or, or if they're off work, then, then what happens there? So it's really trying to, to get a, uh, an overview before. Uh, you start the clinical presentation about what this problem is, uh, how it's affecting the patients in front of you. And uh, what they tell you will then directly lead to the next step, which is trying to elicit what kind of functional capacity do they have for, for uh, sort of moving, uh, doing tasks during their daily activities. Uh, so during the story, this will sort of link you to if they can't play with their kids, then obviously you have to look at uh, what that involves and whether it's uh, flexion of the back or being able to be in a squat position for a suspended uh, period of time. So, so that will guide you towards what we call the behavioral experiments, where you ask the patient to demonstrate uh, the things that they don't feel they're able to do. Uh, uh, and then you start have that as a starting point for what kind of capacity you're trying to build uh, within the patient. Uh, we see patients uh, with both ends of the spectrum where you could have a patient presentation where there, you'd say there is a, a, a protective behavior. So if somebody had a, I can uh, take an example, if you had a sprained ankle, you wouldn't say to somebody limping, it's, it's bad for you to limp. You'd probably say, well, you can limp for a while, but then you've got to start uh, exposing that uh, leg again to uh, normal uh, loading. And equally with the back or, or the neck or the shoulder, this is the same. You have to figure out whether it, you think it's a, a, a protective behavior or it's a provocative behavior. So if it's a provocative behavior, then uh, when you're doing behavioral experiments, you try and look uh, and elicit together with the patient whether there are alternatives to, to doing this the other way. Uh, and then uh, you can look at whether you think people are uh, decondition which we quite often see uh, whether they have unusual pain behaviors uh, depending on what they've been told by the others and, and so forth um, and uh, you, you kind of make a, a diagnosis based on that and, and although we call it non-specific I, I don't think anyone would say they feel they they treat non-specific if they have a patient where there are no red flags and no specific diagnosis so I guess in terms of the diagnosis, you could say you come to a, a working diagnosis, which is where do we want to focus uh, this plan to try to get you back to your day activities of daily living. So, um, and then look at the contributing factors uh, in that respect. So I think that's a sort of a broad overview of, of what we're trying to achieve uh, within that um, uh, alliance that you're trying to make with the patient. Okay, so you, you go from uh, essentially looking at every aspect of the patient. Now, this is something that I did want to discuss uh, a little later on, and we'll come back to uh, sort of the yep. time it takes to get to know a patient, the ins and outs of the patient's problem and, and the patient themselves so well, because it's, you know, if, if you have half an hour with a patient, it maybe takes a little longer than that. Obviously, you've been doing it a fair bit longer than I have, both physiotherapy and your use of CFT. So for me, it's going to take a few sessions. But after a while, you probably get into a flow of figuring out the best way to get the information from the patient and how to guide them along their story. But you, you get that information and you look at the functional aspects of, okay, this is when you get the pain. Uh, this mm. is what you're doing. How can we then adjust the behavior? or adjust mm. how you're executing that. Um, would you say that that's a fair summary? Yeah, yeah. and that's a, fair, that's, that's a fair summary. Yeah, yeah. so you're trying to, uh, you kind of try and, but I guess it's, it's uh, and this is uh, where the complexity sometimes can be hard to grasp, I guess, because 
sometimes, and, and you're probably familiar with this concept, that you can have a, a chat to somebody and, and you feel you're either going somewhere or you're not. Uh, and then you, you say, okay, say you don't feel you're getting anywhere. And then when you get into the sort of functional habits or, or what they do, it's like they believe it differently if they feel a difference in their body. So that concept of actually internally trying to understand what goes on, I think is very important part of this system uh, where uh, it's actually the, the experience that the patient is having with the, with the function that you're trying to achieve that is, is dictating, uh, I think, whether they, they feel that it's, it's something they have control over or not. Uh, a lot of it is about the, the issue of whether they feel safe to do that specific task or whether they know whether it's, they're doing it the correct way or not. So it's a lot of exposure and reinsurance. So if you were to divide that then into the sort of following three categories, you can say the first thing we need to do, obviously, through the creating an alliance with the patient is, is trying in some way to make sense out of their pain. This doesn't mean that we are listening to somebody, they come in with 20 years of back pain and, and you sit there for half an hour and suddenly you sort of know everything that goes on in their life. That's just ridiculous. But it, it, it's where we start and, and try to connect with the patient and, and by them allowing them, uh, by us allowing them to tell the story we can then together in a, in a teamwork, uh, try to figure out how can we make sense of the experience that you've had to this point. Um, and I think that's kind of hard for us as physios because we've been, the pattern recognition stuff, it's been very sort of enlisted in us. So and we tend to, in. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So we actually quite hard sometimes just to sit and listen without, getting feeling the urge of now i'm going to tell you what the reason is for your pain right so uh, that that then entails a different kind of questioning so uh, stopping up and and listening and maybe uh, reflecting back to the patients and and ask what, what do you think this means and and so forth so so it's a different form of of um i mean I guess I shouldn't say different because I guess some people would say this is what I do so you can't really generalize but but from my experience I wasn't taught in that manner I was taught to sort of if you have pain radiating down the L5 dermatome then then it's the L5 dermatome problem right and, and you had to recognize that and you will then jump in and tell them oh it's from your L5 I'm 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 sort of oversimplifying it a little bit but but it, it kind of holds true I guess as well for some for some parts Okay. Um, and then, so where would you then draw the parallels or the differences between something like CFT, the ACT model and CBT? Because uh, confronting is probably a bit too strong a word, but you're uh, bringing some awareness to the patient about their behaviors, their movements, their pain, what's going on. So mm. yeah, where would you maybe not draw lines, but yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that's a great question. And uh, it's also kind of a hard question, I think, to answer because, as you know, uh, uh, ACT and CBT will mean different things to different people. Uh, but I guess uh, if, if you look at all of them, I would say CFT, ACT and CBT are all, they're behavioral orientated uh, sort of uh, interventions. Uh, and they kind of, they're all psychologically informed. And as you say, they're, they're, they're involved in looking at the, uh, the cognitions of the patients, uh, their context, uh, whether they are, have flexibility to change uh, their sort of understanding. So you could say that they are all similarities. Uh, and I guess uh, CFT, as I said, uh, if you look at the cognitive functional part, I, it has a lot of onus on the, on the function. Uh, but then some would say, well, so does ACT, but, it, but I would say from the functional aspect, this is really where I think CFT sort of highlights that behavior, uh, which, which I think kind of lends, if you look at the background of, of uh, Peter O'Sullivan, uh, Wim Dankert, uh, Kieran, 
uh, everyone that seems to have been involved in this, uh, mostly they are, <laughs> it's physio sort of driven research. Uh, not to say that it can't be utilized by other professions, but I'm just saying that movement part where you're sort of trying to induce movement, behavior, uh, movement and behavior together, then, then that's uh, very much uh, uh, a function of, of CFT. Um, so I don't know if I'm right to say this, um, but I feel that CFT has a, uh, if you were, I, I don't like the sort of trying to say something is talk therapy and then something is sort of more functional because that, yeah. So, so I, I don't want to offend anyone with what I'm saying now, but I, but I feel that that CFT without the functional part is not really CFT, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. So, so although the storytelling and all that's really important, but it's the plan, it's the action of how you sort of put that into the uh, the sort of uh, graded exposure that you do as part two of that intervention. So the making sense is the first part degraded exposures to the to the physical sort of uh, limitations uh, as i said is the second part and then addressing lifestyle uh, behaviors uh, other than that is also a third step in that. and and it's not to say that it's one two and three they they go sort of uh, hand in hand sometimes and and depending on where you want to start with that uh, client okay so where would you say that there's a a difference between the therapist that will use CFT to help their patient and help the problem together working towards that goal and the therapist who says, okay, we're just going to use uh, this exercise program, um, not a generic one, one specific to that patient, but they're yeah. saying, okay, we're just going to go yeah. one-to-one on this exercise program. Yeah, I think that's another great question. And again, I, I don't want to uh, sort of uh, stigmatize people doing one or the other. But but I think uh, uh, the the one thing I think which is kind of different is the, is the uh, interviewing part uh, that that you will uh, be guided. And and that's why we say maybe motivational interviewing is at the core of how CFT. Uh, things around the interview, uh, but uh, at the same time, if 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 you're if you're doing a good sort of uh, physical examination of of the therapist, I'd say that that this is kind of what we have been doing. Uh, but depending then on your message to that patient, so a difference could be uh, I want you to do squatting, but there's a difference between saying unless you have straight back and your knees over your toes uh, you're not squatting the right way so that would not be a typical cft uh, approach because you're trying to maybe uh, sort of avoid the the the, the one size fits all movement uh, categories uh, yeah not again, necessarily looking uh, at the biomechanical but then no, going for the patient yeah. within Absolutely. their tolerances exactly but then again, I mean, as you know, I mean, sometimes you have to think so more biomechanically, but then the biomechanics also will guide you to say, uh, how do you feel when you do it this way, whether you're doing it that way? And, and sometimes the patient will say, well, this feels much better. And, and then you're not saying, oh, that's biomechanically wrong. So therefore, uh, it's not a good solution. So I guess you'll be guided by, by, the, by the response that you're getting right there and then. But I think to your point is that you can do great interventions by doing a, a proper physical examination and, and doing an, a, a sort of a targeted exercise prescription. Um, but then I would also say, so let's do it with the patients. So if you had a patient coming in high sensitivity, they have back pain uh, and you give them uh, uh, you give them home exercise of some sort that's specific to what you think is going on. Uh, if you're not asked about their uh, stress levels, their sleep, their social sort of uh, context, I would say you could potentially miss out on, on other markers will be uh, as important as the exercise prescription itself. So I guess it's, it's having that wider lens where you're trying to say, well, if you sleep four hours uh, a night uh, regularly, 
uh, why don't we also, in addition to the exercise, try to, to get you on a plan to get proper sleep? So, so I guess it's, it's that notion without saying it's the sleep that caused your back pain. It's, it's trying to look at um, health care of the, of the person rather than to think that you're dealing with disease care, which I quite often think that that is the case. You find the sort of the trigger or, or the nociceptive drive, and then you sort of treat the, the disease as opposed to sort of try to induce good health in that person. Okay. I don't know if that made sense. Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, sort of taking a more holistic approach and treating more than just yeah. the injury. It's taking everything into account to ensure the best results, not just in the short term, in the two, three months after they see you, but also in the long term so that they have sort of the tools on how to continue and carry forward the lessons that they've learned yeah with their therapist exactly yeah exactly so when... because the big problem of what we do is 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 uh the sort of belief that we are the fixers of them i mean if you if you think of say one of your patients coming in uh, half an hour a week it's still 167.5 hours for the rest of that week so if you think that the magic is happening in the room i i think you're probably delusional <laughs> Or a wizard. Yeah, or a wizard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, I mean, you can, uh, yeah. So, but I think, again, it's trying to build that capacity, the resilience of the patient. Um, I guess, though, the word holistic can be misused a lot. Like, if you tell everyone to, to sleep, do meditation, drink three liters of water, uh, uh, exercise, or whatever, you can still say, yeah, I'm now doing a holistic approach, but, yeah. but I would argue that, that it has to be holistic in context of that person. So that's, again, where the, the alliance is important, because if, as you know, if we try to push things on patients, it, it rarely goes uh, oh, no. very well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely not. I remember having that conversation yeah. with a previous guest of trying to force information onto a patient and it just not going down well uh in personal experiences. No. Uh so yeah. Where do you uh when you see a patient for the first time, do you then have a longer session than normal? How do you find time to have these conversations because I'll I'll be honest from my own practice, I don't tend to I, I don't think in my first session I get all the information that may be relevant and then I may try to get a bit more out of them as we're going through and I think every physio does that uh, regardless yeah. that you get to know your patient a yeah. little bit as you're treating them I think that's normal and if you're not getting to know your patient as you're treating them yeah there's something going on there um, yeah but do you do you take a little bit longer you mentioned that you have the the uh orbro form that you get them to fill out beforehand uh yeah yeah right so i i would argue that time is a very important component of of uh not just cft but any any sort of instance where where you're dealing with particularly long-standing problems i would say and and even like acute problems as well can can be so uh, i would never see a patient for less than an hour for the first consult uh, within that hour uh, usually when i fill in their details they will fill out the orbro so that doesn't really steal any time away from the consultation it just takes a couple of minutes to do and then what i'll do i'll i'll place the orbro screening questionnaire next to my computer or my uh, keyboard uh, and as we talk, I will sort of glance on the uh, Orobro and, and if they have, uh, say, scored, uh, they, they don't sleep very well or they're highly stressed or, or one of the, then I will ask, I will invite myself into that domain of saying, so I can see you, you're scoring such and such on, on your sleep. Would you like to tell me more about that? So. The, the, the point, again, is that you're trying to use that dimension not to come across as somebody to, you're not being, um, because if somebody comes in to us and they know I'm going to a manual therapist, and then suddenly you're asking these extra questions about stress, sleep, 
uh, resilience and all this, some people can get a bit intimidated. But if they, my experience, if they sort of listed it out themselves, it's much easier to invite yourself in without coming across as too inquisitive, if you like. It's a bit more of a uh, warm start. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. And, and um, I also believe that it's a misnomer that patients don't like us being interested. I mean, I, I find that they, a, a lot of people say, I've not been listened to, I don't feel I've been heard. So, so I think the, the idea that we're spending time with somebody is, is, is good. Then when I say, if I do a workshop and I do a live demo, that's always going to be the question. Yes, yeah, so you spent this what, one and a half hour demonstration in front of us. I have 20 minutes for my patient. So can you please tell me how what you used one and a half hour is going to be done in 20 minutes? And I don't think it can. Like, I think it's um, impossible. But uh, I also think it's a misconception that we need to be using just the first session to figure everything out, as you said. Uh, and I think, again, from the profession, we've quite been dwelled in that uh, understanding that after the first time, you should have a, a diagnosis, a plan, get the goals. And that's not going to change through the course of the patient whatsoever. And if you think about that, it's, it's, it's not very sensible because the patients change on day to day basis and week to week. And we know this. So so I think um, and this is actually something I discussed with another one of our uh, collaborators, Ian Cowell. So he he had a great tip and he would say, so if I've done the first session, I will after the session reflect on whether I think I need to set up not half an hour for the next time, but maybe an hour for the next time as well. So, so he would make a judgment call on, right, this patient needs more time the next time uh, we see each other. And I think that's uh, very sensible. It's almost like you're trying to figure out what kind of uh, loading or what kind of uh, 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 dosage is required for us to make a good, uh, good start in this uh, alliance. Uh, so, so that means you could spend one hour for the first time and then you say, well, I need 45 minutes at least for the second. Uh, and, and then, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll, and I did that just with a patient the other day. I, I said, so, so thank you for telling me everything. I think it's important that we spend this time listening to your story. Would it be okay for you if we uh, stop today and then we, we followed up from here the next time? And uh, with people having pain for... 10 or 20 years, I've, I've not heard somebody say, no way, you should have it all figured out by what by now. They, they usually say, well, wow, you must be really interested in, in, in my story and, and trying to figure out how you can help me. So, so I think that, uh, so I say, I, I don't think we should apologize for spending one and a half hour or two hours with somebody who's had a, a pain problem for five, 10 years. It's, it's really important. I think. Yeah. So I guess that's... Uh, Saying that, I do, I do understand that, that there's, uh, there are confinements within, uh, say, a clinic, and, and the supervisor will say, well, you should see 20 patients a day. And, and I see that as a big, uh, big problem. But maybe then we have to be even better at deciding, so who do I need? The, who can be the 30-minute patient? Yeah. And who cannot be the 30-minute patient? And then actually sort of almost... Uh, make us uh, try to figure out who that is so you can spend the time with the ones needing it okay uh, so this is obviously something that you've developed over a longer period of time it's it's a skill that yeah you know, it's not something that came overnight how long is it that you've been using it uh during your time as a physiotherapist when were you introduced to it yourself right so so i was uh i guess i was first introduced to it by the early work uh, of uh, peter o'sullivan uh back in uh, into 1999 2000 with his uh, spondylolysthesis study but but back then it was all much more sort of movement based you were trying to elicit and and we talked about classification so he's been on the forefront i think to try and develop this further on all the time based on the research that the different projects has uh, elicited uh, so so it, it has changed quite a bit so i would say i'd probably used it so when i finished my my masters i was um 
for a while I would say I was a manual manual therapist like I was very it was the hands-on the skills of examining and, and uh, doing that uh, those uh, interventions uh, but I, I quite quickly became frustrated with the fact that I felt the patient was coming back uh, all the time they 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 wanted to uh, so so that then increased that uh, sort of um, uh, I guess uh, uh, interest in, in trying to figure out whether there was a different way to to make sure the patient uh, had the self-management uh, strategies in place um, when it comes to uh, the practice of it, it it's like uh, I think it's sensible to look at I don't know if you know the famous Michael Jordan quote where he says he's missed 6,000 shots he's had a chance to to win the game 26 times and he haven't and 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 he highlights the fact that that you have to miss a few times in order to success uh, to be successful so so again i i like the notion of it's not a it's not an end journey it's kind of a process where you're going through and you're trying to and, and this is uh, i think back to i perceive from a question it, some people would say, well, you should have such and such experience. But you can also say, the, on the contrary to that, if you're young and you're new, you don't have to make all the mistakes first and then figure them out. And then, because you can actually use some of the, the learning from, from the research. And uh, so, so I think it's, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a, a, a newly grad or, or having, it, it depends on, on what your, your, and context and and also what type of therapist you want to be it's it's uh i i, I guess uh, a colleague of mine called Sigurd Mikkelsen he, he says it, it's about what kind of footprint do you want to leave we talk about carbon footprint but it's what kind of footprint do you want to leave as a as a physiotherapist do you want to leave one where you sort of uh, highlight your skills through your techniques or what you're doing and it's all about you sort of fixing people or or it's the operator versus the interactor thing yes and i'm not uh, i'm trying not to be judgmental of, of how people practice because i think they should themselves but, but for me i decided that i want to be somebody who tried to elicit uh, uh, the patient's capabilities in in their journey Okay. That actually brings me quite nicely to my next question there, um, where I wanted to ask you, do you think there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, people coming through their studies from their bachelors and this kind of understanding of helping your patient develop the tools and you're not a mechanic. They're not a car that's coming in that you're going to fix and send out. It's you're, you're meant to be helping them and, ideally teaching them ways that they can uh, get on with their life and get through it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the definite answer to that is yes, <laughs> because uh, great. Short uh, and sweet. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, yeah. And, and, and particularly I can't, I can't answer for obviously all institutional or educational institutions, uh, but I have a fair fair idea of uh, what I was taught. Uh, not uh, so I don't know wh wh how they teach in in Newcastle right now. But I know from Bergen where they have a physical education, uh, physiotherapy education degree, and I'm also part of my job is is involved in the in the master's degree of, of manual therapy. So I would definitely say uh, there's a dissonance there, and and these things take some time to change because there'll be people uh, within that sort of system that will hold on to some of the older or, or uh, the ways of doing things like they always have been done. Uh, saying that though, I also have a fair idea of, I've seen a development in our master's program where I've worked, where I would say it's, it's totally different today than say five, 10 years ago. So, so I think there is a change. I guess the question is, um, how big is that change? And, and, and what does, uh, so, so it would be a lovely study if you could look at, say, five years ago, what did the uh, physio come out with in, in terms of their understanding and, uh, and management skills? as opposed to today. And I, I think you see a, a, a trend that, that more people today will 
have the knowledge and capacity of of thinking uh, in in more holistically and and multidimensionally definitely with with uh, pain neuroscience and and some of that uh, stuff coming through although i'm not sure whether it's actually changing how we practice that's the other thing though you can come out of the study you have a, a bigger understanding but does it actually change how you practice and 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 that's maybe back down to what you're saying before when to sort of therapists feel confident that they're able to to talk about stress sleep lifestyle uh, these other things that we weren't really taught in school but but if you look at uh, doctors or or many other professions they were not taught this as well so it, it's a, it's not just a physio problem i think it's a, it's a, it's a societal problem okay yeah no, i see that that's fair and i I see that in myself as well, uh, that there, there are occasions where I am hesitant to to want to touch on certain subjects with patients as I feel maybe they're not ready to open up about it, or maybe it's not my place to ask that might be useful information, but maybe they feel that it's not right for me to, to ask that sort of question. So how do you then look at overcoming boundaries with patients, whether it's in their mindset and working together and then helping the patient realize that some of the onus is on them they yeah. come to you for help and you're going to help them but it's a two-way street there's a little bit of give and yeah. take yeah so so one thing uh, i've found quite useful is to use the, the the four questions of louis gifford i think louis gifford was a great do you know louis gifford not familiar no uh, what, probably see no, him on the face one of the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, he's written the books um, uh, Aches, and, uh, Aches and Pains. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I hope I'm not saying thing, anything wrong now. <laughs> yeah, Aches, Aches and Pains. Uh, okay. yeah. There's uh, great books, uh, uh, three sets. Um, he is working early with, uh, with David Butler and, and was on the forefront of the uh, the pain sort of neuroscience understanding, but he was also much more than that. I think he was much into the behavioral stuff as well. And, and uh, so his four questions would be, uh, so, so when I have a new patient, I will say, is it okay for me if I sort of give you an overview of what I would like us to cover today? So, and, and that's another important point in relation to what you're asking, because rather than, sort of diving into an area i will ask kind of for permission if you like so i will ask is it okay for you if i ask you say about your uh, other stress in your life or something like that and then you can say well they can't really say no when you put it like that which is kind of a fair uh, statement i guess uh, but i will open with that is it okay for you if i tell you what what I've planned for today. So I'm kind of then setting the, uh, the boundaries of, of what the, the uh, consultation should look like. So I say, usually there's four things patients are wondering about. One, what is going on? Like, like what's, what's happening? And two, what can I do to help them? Uh, and three, what can they do to sort of help themselves? And something about time and prognosis. So I think that sort of kind of highlights a, a, a nice overview of, of how you start up with a patient. And, and then they will, based on that, you obviously then have to dwell into the different components of, of the task at hand. And then usually when I finish, I come back to those four questions. So we've now done the examinations uh, and we, I've listened to your story. We've assessed your yellow flags and, and your red flags and, and all that. Uh, so, so this is what I think is going on. And then you sort of uh, use that uh, to draw them in to say, does this make sense to you? Like, you, So you're not just saying this is how it is. You, you again, you invite them in to reflect over what you said and then they can, um, they can uh, sort of uh, agree or disagree or, or be part of that process. So it's a collaborative effort, as you say. Um, and, and I find that many patients have not been taken on that journey. They, they usually have been told what is their problem, but not so much. They've, uh, and, and I will also uh, ask uh, the other four questions uh, of patients. What do you think is going on? Uh, why do you think it, it's so? Uh, do you think you can get better? And, and what do you think it will take to get better? So, so within that session, you're kind of covering both 
the, the, the overarching sort of uh, consultory uh, mission, but you're also then delving into their beliefs and, and what they think. And, and that then can lead you on to where you should go. But, but I, I think it's a great point uh, because with loading, say if you've got an Achilles tendon and you want to load it up, I think as physios, we're quite good now as saying, well, I know something about load. I know I have to load it, but, and sometimes we load it not enough, but, but we have an ID. But when it comes to cognitive and emotional things, I wonder if we sometimes, so if you're on that uh, sort of cognitive journey and you, you sort of understand that, I'm just wondering if we're as uh, adamant to understanding how much should we sort of uh, push into or, or how should we poke people without, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's a bit like the Greg Lehman uh, uh, quote where it's okay to, it's okay to poke the bear, but you shouldn't sort of hump the shits out of it. Like you, you, you don't have to. Yeah. So you have to be careful. And, and uh, I think this again lends to the communication part that a lot of this is uh, down to intuition. So if I, uh, there's, there's a saying by a guy called uh, Gabor Mate, and he says, whenever there's tension, it needs attention. So I think we're quite good if you asked your patient something and you, you sense there was a tension that they said, I don't really want to go into this, then your intuition would probably make you stop. I mean, mm. if you had some uh, social antennas, I would say. Uh, uh, but, but also the other part is that, uh, and this is back to your previous comment, if, if there's tension in me for asking the question, I should probably be aware of that as well. So if I don't feel comfortable asking the question, maybe I, I, I shouldn't ask it. So, so this is, again, back to just having that. Uh, uh, it's like a dance, could you say? The, the, whole, the whole interaction is like a dance. So when should you lead? When should you follow? And, and it's really that dance that you're trying to achieve through this uh, uh, continuous uh, evaluation of, of the interaction, I guess. OK. Um, one other question. So off topic uh, from this and then we're gonna uh, bring it back but um do you notice a difference between the uh effectiveness of the cft over chronic and acute patients at all do you see that with the chronic patients it takes hold a bit better or that they're more receptive to it because they've been dealing with it longer or do you find the other way or yeah what do you see it's a great question, and as a lot of uh, answers, uh, more research is needed, I guess, is, yeah, is yeah. the boring answer. Uh, but if you look at the work that has been done, uh, the efficacy work of CT, you could say it's been more geared towards the uh, uh, persistent pain uh, spectrum. Uh, there is sort of plans and have been talked about uh, doing uh, sort of more acute type of interventions as well, or... or interventions for acute pain mm -hmm. i think it's a general misnomer that if you have acute pain then everything is straightforward and and you can do straight things and they'll be fine i mean you could argue that yes due to the uh, regression to mean a lot of patients will get better at what, whatever you do like they they come to see us uh Regression to mean uh, occurs, and we believe it's because something we did, and it might just be natural history of that condition. You're probably familiar with the work of, of Artus, where they looked at this, and, and when they plotted all the, the RCTs, uh, they saw that the effects in the intervention period was very similar, uh, whether they were getting whatever treatment they were getting. Okay. So, so that's kind of interesting in terms of the... Um, but, but I guess my, what I'm trying to call maybe a long-winded answer is uh, dealing with people's belief can have a huge impact on their sort of recurrency of the problem. So if you've been told that you have a, a ruptured disc and every time you feel pain in your back, you believe that, okay, there's a rupture coming out again, then I would argue that that's a different sort of neurophysiological scenario than, than if you have a, a different belief. So, so, uh, but I can't answer your question as opposed to saying this is what would happen if you did it uh, in acute pain and we've got as 
for now, we have more evidence for the efficacy for the consistent pain population. But, but if you ask for my opinion, I don't know if you did. That was it, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But if you did, I would argue that doing an intervention uh, where you had the same conversation, uh, conversation uh, assess the beliefs, got people on a good path, um, try to, to focus on, on some of the resilience that's, that's in the body, I would, I would put money on that that would, would be, work quite well. But I could be wrong. I mean, there's, uh, it's not just one thing going on in a person's life. Like there's, uh, there's lots of things. And if you look at, um, I think JP uh, Canero's study, who's, who's uh, one of uh, Pete's uh, recent uh, PhD students and, and now um, his collaborator in, in, uh, in CFT, uh, he's done a lovely study where he actually did, uh, he followed up patients, um, tracking them uh, with case uh, studies. And the lovely thing about that is that rather than having a, a, a pre and a post, say, three months and then a one-year follow-up, he actually did uh, fortnightly sort of uh, measures. And, and that allowed him to track quite well what was going on. And you saw exactly what I was talking about before, that patients are, their pain profiles can, can, have, can change. Uh, but interestingly, he also found that they seem to follow each other. So if your pain goes up, your fear will go up, your lack of uh, confidence in your own uh, sort of coping strategies can, can also go up. So, and disability uh, goes up as well. So, so he did see that there was a, they sort of follow each other, but, but he also saw that if you were, if your husband was admitted to hospital, then suddenly that, obviously increase the, the sensitivity of your system and, and that could also make your pain worse without actually being uh, having done something different in terms of how you move and, and so, so it just shows the I guess the complexity of, of a person. How do you help the patient discover the resilience of their body um, in your practice with your patients? Are, are there any particular techniques you use to bring it to their attention that Hey, your buddy's your buddy. Your body is quite a robust <laughs> machine. Um, yeah, you know it can do more than what we think. What you, yeah, yeah. So I guess the easy answer to that is that I will chase patients with the particular things they're afraid of doing. And uh, I can think of a recent patient I saw who who'd been told that that he he couldn't run, like he, he shouldn't run, or or he should avoid sort of getting the, uh, his back, uh, he was, had been told that that's caused jamming of your back. And, 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 and you could tell just by getting him to walk, he was so sort of focused on holding his core and tightening everything. And, and so he was creating that tension even before he started walking. So one way of, of exploring that with him was to try and, and uh, explore uh, running or walking in a new way and then seeing how he felt. And, and as soon as he relaxed, he breath, breathed through his uh, stomach, uh, had a different sort of walking, you could feel the change straight away. So that's a way of just exposing him and getting him to in interoceptively understand that there's a difference between how he was doing it and, and how he could do it. So, so that would be something that I see a lot with patients. So the same thing, if, you, if people are fearful of bending, we sometimes sit them on a stool and then we put their elbows to the knees and then we try and get them to reach down the leg. And, and suddenly before they know it, they're already in full flexion. And then you, you get them to stand up from holding on to their legs. And, and you say, well, you didn't think you were able to do that when you came in and now you just done it within like three seconds. So that's creating a, a discrepancy between what they think they are able to do and what they're able to do through that behavioral experiment. So that would be a typical example of, of, of that. Okay, nice. Um, I, I suppose it's quite nice you brought in the example of your runner patient. Um, are there any other particular mm -hmm. stories that you can share with us, uh, it's success stories or even learning moments that you can share with the audience? Yeah, so I, th I think uh, uh, 
that uh, particular sort of mindset of where you ask somebody. So the question could be, what kind of things would you do tomorrow if you had no pain? Which, which say, say that they've, they've had this journey and, and you ask them, what, what kind of things would you do tomorrow without the pain? And then they say, well, I would go for a run. I would go for a hike up that mountain that I haven't been doing for a while. So then I guess the next question is, is there a way we could start here now to actually mimic that type of, of um, so I can think of, a, of, a, of an older guy that I had uh, not too long ago that he was a uh, he lost his wife and he was uh, sort of he, he was a pensioner and he had a he won't and then this pain was was massive in his life and he he couldn't do much and and it was like he wanted to explore the good things in life because of the sorrow he went through uh, and one of his goals was to ride a Harley Davidson on the Route 66 so so when he came to me he had absolutely no uh, muscle power in his legs to be able to hold a Holly Davidson. So then one way of projecting that was not to say, I want you to do squatting, but it was trying to contextualize what we're doing here with single squats, uh, squatting and all these kind of things. It's trying to, we're trying to balance the Holly Davidson as you do this, right? So it was trying to put um, a kind of a spin to the thing that he really wanted to do uh rather than just saying i want you to squat i want you to so so you can see how how trying to make sense out of the activity as well can sometimes be very uh and and then as soon as he developed this kind of uh, uh uh confidence in in being able to to fully load on on one of the legs we could they say well do you think you're ready to to take it out for a spin and and i then linked up with his son and they were he was there to help him because obviously he didn't couldn't bring the Harley into the practice, which, which sometimes, I guess you would love to be able to do that, to go and see somebody in their home and you could actually say, okay, let's practice the Harley Davidson, uh, getting it off the, and starting up and being able to balance it. So, so again, you just see how you have to use your imagination with these things and, and roll with the, with the patient uh, to create that kind of a moment. And, and I see it again and again, patients, having been told it's like a self uh, inflicting sort of belief like somebody tells you you can't run and you get them to run or, or somebody say you can't run the the Harley Davidson and suddenly they're thinking well I can do it now because I'm strong enough in that so it, it's not just and, and this is again you're not just saying to them oh you should just believe and then you will be strong to ride a Harley Davidson you're actually saying okay I'm here with you I'll make a plan and stay with you in a graded exposure model so we can get you to believe that that's, you've got the capabilities of doing that again. And then you, you're testing it uh, as part of the, of the therapy. Okay, grand. And have you got any maybe uh, learning moments that you've had uh, during your time uh, practicing that you... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so many. Uh, yeah. I, I know uh, you kind of asked me what share some success stories, but but I do wonder if we should have a, a conference of uh, uh, where everyone is is presenting their failed cases, because that's also I guess uh, part of our our clinical experience that that we're that we sometimes we're too quick to to uh, I if I have an agenda with the patient that they've not asked for. I'm not really compassionate to their problem. And I've, I've had lots of learning experience on that. And, and then if, if the patients don't come back, you want to ring them up and say, well, where did I go wrong? Could I, could I try again and do it differently? But obviously that's difficult without coming across as a stalker. <laughs> but I, w <laughs> I would say that, that that has been definitely a learning experience that I, I, I've pushed too hard on, 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 an agenda and and it's not gone well because i wasn't adamant to their needs if you like uh, when it comes to uh, uh i think the other part is that i've had patients uh say uh, quite depressed uh, uh not a lot of exercise uh maybe not eating well uh, sleep habits are poor 
and you give them a plan for exercise and then without actually doing a, a sort of psychologically informed uh, direct psychotherapy you see that all these other domains is also lifted and, and being better so if they start moving then suddenly their their weight goes down they feel better and 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 of course we know these ripple effects but but i think the the notion that you have to do you have to do the therapy for that exact dimension is is, is another learning experience i guess but then you could say in that context of uh, being with a patient i guess we are always psychologically informed if you like because we're listening we're uh, understanding we show compassion and, and all that kind of thing but, but and, and that's why that's probably the most important commodity we have like it's it's and and i don't know if you're familiar with the saying it's not it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has and i guess that really entails that notion of trying to uh, understand the person behind the, the their problems yeah uh, uh, and i really like that i like that that's quite powerful um, yeah <laughs> yeah what uh if someone wanted to get more information on this wanted to find out more and get more involved and add it into their own practice and how they yeah. treat their patients what reading recommendations have you got or anything like that yeah so uh i'll uh, i guess the the first one is is uh, the pain ed uh, website that's uh, usually where uh, people can find a lot of the resources that and also the the uh, the research uh, projects um i'm happy to give you the link to that if if you're not if yes, i don't know if you put it put it in the show notes or, or something like that okay, it's pain uh, hyphen ed right but yeah say it, say yeah, it for the, yeah yeah so it's www.pain hyphen ed.com um uh, and in there there are different uh, uh uh headings that people can click on whether it's resources uh, it's upcoming uh, web uh, workshops. Uh, obviously, right now it's all a bit uh, Corona uh, sort of, uh, uh, but I guess later in the year there'll be uh, more uh, workshops maybe coming back up again. I know it's um, um, in the Netherlands in September as well, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, so I was going back uh, in June, but that's been uh, sort of cancelled. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, follow the likes of uh, Peter O'Sullivan on Twitter, uh, Kieran O'Sullivan, Mary O'Keefe, uh, JP, myself, Wim Dankes, uh, Casper Ussing, uh, Chris. Uh, per, uh, uh, but but if uh, if you go into the actually the best thing is to, to go into the Paynet website and then look at the collaborators of of Paynet and then. I think follow people on Twitter as well. It's quite good for just uh, getting to know what people are up to and, and what they're spreading. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I'm on Facebook and Twitter myself um, where I post uh, uh, a little bit. We're not maybe so good on Instagram, but maybe that's another platform that could be used. Um, yeah. And how can I people find that's... you on those? What Are you under Karch and Fearsome? Uh, Charter yeah, Fearsome, yeah, just, yeah, just Charter and Fearsome. That's it and uh, they can follow them there and if you google my name it'll come up uh, my email through the university and, and so forth okay great well look, thank you very much uh for giving us your time today it was a pleasure uh, to have you on and uh yeah, well, it's great chatting to you likewise and, and thank you for having me and, and keep up the great work in promoting uh good stuff on the on the on the podcast we'll do our best well ladies and gents thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time as always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time. Peace.